Welcome back to the channel, everybody. I am McAlphanin. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. I would greatly appreciate that. And if you could, please click that like button. It greatly helps the video be seen by more people. Turn it into a rocket and send it to the moon. <laughs> so we have a bevy of topics to cover today. I will be, for the first time, utilizing timestamps. Okay, so I hope that, that will help a little bit. I just learned how to do it. We're improving here, slowly but surely. Um, we have a bevy of topics to discuss. Crypto has been looking very, very good in my opinion as of late. Um, a lot of people have been able to take very healthy profits. All right, the volatility has been amazing as far as accumulation, taking profits, accumulation, taking profits. Now, when I say taking profits, I am not talking about the banking coins, all right? But every other coin, profit, 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 profit. All right, so <laughs> I'm not talking about XLM personally. XLM, Algorand, HBAR, XRP. Listen, listen, we're hunting that white whale, okay? So, but everything else, we're not married to those things. We're not married to, I won't say specific protocol, but yes, profits have been lovely. Um, let us begin here. Danelle Dixon and Stellar have been doing an amazing job reaching out to the world, reaching out to the banks. They're on a multitude, she's on a multitude of panels, the Stellar, representing the Stellar Development Foundation. Um, they have been carrying the message of interoperability, of mass adoption of uh, within the banking sector. And here we have a tweet from Stellar and it says, join at Danelle Dixon 1019. Uh, I actually believe this is going on from October 18th to October the, the, the 21st. Uh, and it's called the uh, Premier Fintech for, uh, Policy Forum. Okay, so if you get a chance to check this out, um, sometimes they have Zoom, right? Sometimes they have the video available. You just have to sign up. Uh, they are very informative. And once again, she's going to be on a panel. Uh, it's happening 9.50 a.m. Eastern Standard Time for a discussion on CBDCs uh, with women leaders from at World Bank at World Bank, so that this is huge. This is a, these are indicators of who they have communications with, contacts with, who's willing to work with Stellar Development Foundation, and at Kansas City Fed. So they're going to be having discussions, giving their ideas on CBDCs, but it, it, also they're going to be absorbing information from each other. Danelle is very informative and very persuasive. This is very good. So. Once again, Stellar Development Foundation and their fearless leader, Danelle Dixon, is doing wonderful things. What does that mean for you and I? They're, if they're doing a great job and we can have any of these protocol adopted in mass, you and I are going to make absurd amounts of money. That's what we're here, here for. So by all means, cheer them on. Let them know they're doing a good job so they can continue to have that fire in their belly. And it's going to bring us a lot of money. I don't know about you, but I like a lot of money. I mean, I'm, I like absurd amounts of money. So they're doing a wonderful job there. Okay, so also Stellar has released a blog. I think this was released an hour ago. And it is titled, The Principles Behind Protocol Design AMMs. It's by Jonathan Jove. You can find it on the uh, Stellar.org blog. Uh, it was released today, an hour ago. And it's all about Protocol 18. Now, I believe that Jonathan is an engineer who worked on Protocol 18. So it gives you a little bit of insight into why, not a little bit, it gives you a substantial amount of insight into why this is important, why this is, uh, this is a great move and a great addition to uh, XLM, the, the, the Stellar uh, blockchain, all right? So here, there's a paragraph. Let's just, just tap into this a little bit and then we'll move to another topic. Two proposals. Two goals. It says in April 2021, two different draft proposals for automated market makers were published. It was a rare event. There have never been multiple proposals for the same uh, feature drafted at the same time. And it demonstrated a widespread interest in adding AMMs to Stellar. The two proposals differed in a few key ways. And this immediately exposed the tension between two competing goals. First, the initial version of automated market makers should be as simple as possible. Second, automated market makers should be deeply integrated into the Stellar protocol. That's very important in my humble opinion, very important. Um, 
The simplicity goal sounds well simple enough, but simple means different things to different people. From my perspective as an implementer of Stellar Corp, a simple design is one that is easier to implement and test from the pers uh, uh, perspective of people who build on Stellar. However, a simple design is one that is easier to work with. When a design is simple in both of these ways, users benefit by access, by getting access to high quality products quickly. Listen, this is key. This is key when it comes to working with banks and persuading them to use the protocol ease of use. As we have uh, heard from the Bank of International Settlements, we're going to get to them in a, in a moment also, a little, little later. But as we've heard from the Bank of International Settlement, Settlements, they need simplicity that will allow them not only to advance in the future, save a ton of money and be completely secure, but to also allow it also allows them to continue their normal day-to-day -day processes without imposing too much burden, additional burden, on their staff, on their workers, on their structures, okay? They've made this quite clear in their documents. So, going by that and the fact that the Bank of International Settlements, and it seems to me, we're gonna cover this later, the International Monetary Fund are on the same wavelength as far as the understanding and utilization of blockchain technology and all future coming technologies, that, uh, uh, this is something that is uh, evenly agreed upon throughout the industry, right? So even when you have uh, like the European Central Bank, we'll also be talking about them, uh, even with their doubts of blockchain as such, simplicity of use is something that would have to be agreed upon is beneficial across the board. So Stellar making this a linchpin of upgrades to the protocol is, is very, very good. Keep it simple, keep it easy to use, and make it quick to be adopted and adapted to within that particular system. Um, let's continue on here. It says, consider the following high-level design concept. Automated market makers are entirely independent of the existing decentralized exchange, and there is an entirely new suite of operations to interact with them. This design would have been relatively simple to implement, but it wouldn't have been deeply integrated with, with the Stellar protocol it definitely wouldn't have been simple to you. So this is why it's important to have a voice also uh, by certain entities uh, making their, their thoughts known on keeping these things simple opens up the pathway, as I said before, for banks and large institutions to more easily and quickly adopt mass uh, in mass this particular protocol. We don't need burdens. What does that mean for you and I? That means if it's, if it's that much more tempting to banks and institutions to utilize, that could mean a lot of money for us. But if Stellar made the mistake of making it more complicated, that could be a turnoff for the banks and institutions, and they could easily go with another protocol. There's a lot of great protocol out there, Algorand, HBAR, XRP. But for holders of Stellar, because some people do only hold Stellar, I don't particularly, I hold all the banking coins, I love them all. I'm gonna make money everywhere that it comes from. Believe me, I am. But for those who are loan holders of, of, of XLM, Stellar, they definitely will benefit from this and would not have benefited from a more complicated system. So I'm glad that the engineers are making their voices heard and it's making things better leaning towards the mass adoption of Stellar. And this is one of the reasons why Stellar has been making a lot of movements uh, and penetrating a lot of markets. And uh, there's a lot of deals coming up, I believe, if those things get signed, I'm not at liberty to talk about certain things, but if these deals come through, I think it will be quite shocking to many people. Maybe not, maybe not, maybe some people expect these, these deals to come through, but we will see with time. Okay, so now, that I believe is very good. Uh, I'm going to put a link to this in the community tabs, okay? Let's move on here. We have the IMF, all right? Now, Kristalina Georgieva, I, I have a great res respect for uh, Kristalina, has been doing a great job at iterating the uh, concern about stability when it comes to utilizing the blockchain and crypto rails to move uh, uh, to move their CBDCs back and forth and to act as bridge currencies and such. And I agree with Kristalina. They just had a, a, a panel and it had the Bank of International S Settlements and it was uh, the IMF and they were giving their ideas on um, 
the utilization of blockchain in the future uh, on CBDC, stable coins, et cetera. I will be putting a link in the community tab to that as well. Uh, I agree, regulation is important. I agree with Gary Gensler also that regulation is important. Why? Some people don't understand this. I believe I'm going to try to bring some clarity to this right now. So a lot of institutions have held back, not because of just regulatory clarity. They held back because the asset class is not a respected one and it's not a safe one. All right. So you have a lot of scam coins. I hate to say that, but it's true. You have a lot of scam coins that are bringing a lack of respect, a lack of prestige to crypto. Uh, and so they're not going to enter that market when you have things like come rocket coin and, and, and mom's coin and all of these doggy coins. Unfortunately, even though some of the dog coins like Shiba are becoming respected protocol, they have an entire ecosystem that they're building and have become a serious crypto uh, uh, asset in the market. Unfortunately, many of these coins are scam coins and they are very bad. And, and so institutions don't want to jump in the market just yet. That's why they remain lingering in the stock market, which is more respected than crypto right now, even though they don't make the type of gains that crypto can bring in right now. Okay. So once regula regulation comes in, it's going to wipe out, theoretically, wipe out all of those scam coins, take away all of these ridiculous, ridiculously named inappropriate crypto that brings crypto a light of a lack of respect, right? Uh, and then those institutions will want to be involved. A lot of money is being left on the table. I'm telling you, it's being left on the table because there is a lack of, of respect, so to speak, given to the crypto community because of things like that. All the scams, all of the illicit things that happen in crypto are, have been very bad as far as mass adoption of crypto. I mean, it's inevitable. Mass adoption is happening right is, is happening right now, the beginning stages of it. So is it fully uh, underway? No, but it's getting started. I mean, I think we all can see that, but regulation is going to assist that. Regulation will, it not will be good, it can be good. But this is why battles will have to be fought in court. There will have to be clarity. Holders of coins definitely need to make their voices heard more than just the XRP community should be saying something and letting people know what they think. Uh, the, uh, the foundations like Stellar Foundation, Algorand Foundation, they've been doing a great job letting their thoughts be known on how crypto should be regulated and they should. I'd like to hear more from other uh, entities, business entities within the crypto sphere. This affects us all. This affects us all. We're all interconnected. They, a rising tide is going to raise all ships. We're going to make a ton of money if these things go well. So this only happens with action. If you sit on the sidelines, you can't blame anybody for what, what's going to take place if it doesn't go to your liking, okay? You have to be active and then maybe we can do some good things and make good things happen. Uh, however, <laughs> let's get back to this. So the IMF, uh, Georgieva, uh, I agree that regulation is important. Uh, having stability is important. Now, something I don't agree on that George Ava was constantly bringing up in this particular uh, uh, on this particular panel. Like I said, I'm going to put the link. Give it a watch. I'm going to put the link in the community tab. Is that identity? See, now this is where there's a slippery slope. George Ava is leaning more towards crypto being more of an investor uh sort of instrument and it is that's very true it's very security like <laughs> crypto is very security like but i don't agree that it's a security you don't get a vote in, the, in any company because you hold crypto but with my stocks i'm going to get a vote sooner or later if there needs to be a vote taken even if i vote by proxy all right that's very different i get a say so in the company with crypto you don't get a say so in anything although you're expecting a return so there's Nah, there's a little bit of wiggle room here. That's why clarity is needed. However, she's leaning that way, which which is uh, supporting her idea that identity is important and knowing who's using what. This is what I gleaned. I could be wrong. Maybe I misinterpreted what she was saying. You can watch the video yourself. But if we're going to be utilizing CBDCs like digital cash, then like cash, it should not be tied in my humble opinion. I mean, I'm just a crypto researcher, but identity doesn't need to be tied to cash. 
And thus, it would be logical that if this is digital cash, uh, that you don't have to have your identity tied to that as well. And then also another thing, uh, Augustine, you know, the head of the Bank of International Settlements, who I have a great respect for, was, was speaking about the, the amount of energy that is going to take to utilize blockchain technology with, when it comes to central bank digital currencies. And that's true for certain types of blockchains. But what is not being pressed, and it may be because it's still new, is the aspect of QR codes and utilizing QR codes offline, which is what XRP has just brought to the table, right? I believe that's, that's I saw a couple of videos people were speaking on this. I haven't verified it myself. But if XRP is doing such a thing, which means that more crypto companies will be adopting that method of utilizing crypto offline, you don't have to be online to use it, then now how does that impact energy? the energy that is consumed. And then also take into account that a lot of the new crypto is carbon negative, carbon neutral, uses just the tiniest minute amount of energy. Um, but I will take into account that when they were speaking on this issue, the moderator kept saying Bitcoin, right? Well, Bitcoin and the Bitcoin, era. they use Bitcoin to represent crypto. And even though Bitcoin, Bitcoin is amazing. I mean, as far as it, it can make you a lot of money, it is not the premier technological. Uh, it's, it's not the premier when it comes to the technology of crypto. It's not. It's not the best. OK, so, yes, it's going to it consumes a lot of energy. However, don't use that as a crutch for your your argument. If we're talking about an antiquated crypto, it is an antiquated crypto makes you a lot of money. But Bitcoin is antiquated. Uh, the same ideas don't apply to XRP. XLM, Algorand, and HBAR. This is important because uh, uh, as we're interacting with the SEC, and I hope a lot of you are watching the SEC uh, videos they've been putting out and answering the polls. They've been asking you for your opinion. And Gary Gensler has been saying, hey, this is your opportunity to, to talk to me. This is your opportunity to let me know what you feel about regulation. I hope that you've been doing that. So when we're interacting with governing bodies like that, we need to understand um, where they're coming from as far as their arguments and ideas and how we can combat them with proper uh, uh, factual information. OK, so Bitcoin is not the future of crypto and we don't all have to worry about massive consumption issues. We're talking about XRP, Algorand, HBAR and XLM, Cello, and et cetera. They are very, very energy efficient. So this is an argument that could be nullified, but it would take a lot of us to convey that to these government entities and, and governing bodies like the SEC. So that's why this is important. How does that affect you and I? Because if we can not just convince them, but help them to realize the truth that most of these new advanced protocol are energy efficient, it nullifies that argument that is allowing them to hold crypto uh, back. It, it nullifies that argument that allows them to uh, paint crypto in a negative light. And when they paint crypto in a negative light, they're able to keep the legacy system intact longer. Research is important and making your voice heard is very important. If you want to make a lot of money, sooner than the next 10, 15, 20 years. It's, it behooves you to let these governing bodies uh, know your thoughts, all right? Action is everything, muy linda. And I think about that money, oh, muy linda, mi gente, mi gente. Um, so, there's a, a PDF document here from the IMF, okay? It's, uh, I'm going to post a link to this in the community tabs as well. Uh, and here's a little blurb from it. It's from Adrian, Tobias, and Tommaso Mancini Grifoli from 2021. And it says a new era of digital money, finance and development, June. It's important to know what powerful entities are thinking, what they're going to do, how they're moving, how, how are their, their ideas, uh, being formulated in conjunction with equal bodies. So the IMF and then the Bank of International Settlements to know if they're on the same accord. So then we can have a uh, we can use deductive reasoning, cause and effect to see what's coming in the future. That affects the money we can make in the future. So we're not just making money now. 
and we're not just making good movements now, but we're putting ourselves in a position where we can make good money in the future by knowing what is to come based on cause and effect. All right. So that's why these things are important. Let's continue here. Digital forms of money could be a boon for emerging market and lower income economies if the transition is well managed and regulated. This is what we were just talking about. So right now, one of the linchpins of the IMF is regulation. All right. So I'm hoping we can get these regulations, uh, these regulations out of the way uh, within the next year. This is what I'm, I'm hoping we can at least get a, a foothold on this thing. OK. And start whittling it down to what what regulations do we need? What regulations do we want? And I personally am going to definitely make my voice heard. And I will be making a lot of phone calls too to governing bodies to make sure my voice is heard. Um, so IMF is is focusing on regulation while the Bank of International Settlements. And this is important. The Bank of International Settlements is focused, it seems, from their documents and from what Augustine just said, Mr. Augustine just said, um, on the rapid adoption and implementation of the blockchain. So the Bank for International Settlements right now is one of our biggest friends. OK, it's one of our our biggest allies, so to say, so to speak, um, for the mass adoption of crypto. OK, because they want everyone to utilize it as far as central banks. And they have been um, uh, creating the environment for the testing that has been going on. Remember, they just tested what um, 16 different protocol. Right. Remember when Stellar was one of the Stellar Excellent was one of the finalists. They tested that. Uh, that was in the African region. Right. Then they had another test of Bank of International Settlements did, which was which was in the um, the China, uh, the, the China region or that region around there with China. I'm trying to remember the others that were involved, but I can't really recall it. But you know what I'm talking about. They ran two major tests, the Bank of International Settlements on what is uh, uh, MBDCs. Or, or how, how are they saying it? MCBDCs, multi-blockchain digital currencies, a mega system with multi uh, a multitude of blo uh, blockchains running congealed together for inflow and outflow and, and advanced efficiency. So that's important to know. Who are your allies? Who do we have to convince? Um, who has the most power? How is this going to affect regulation in the future? And how is that regulation going to affect crypto? Because all of that together affects the money that we can make. You have to have these thoughts. These are strategic thoughts. All right. It's like playing chess here. If you want the big money, it's like playing chess. But if you just want a little bit of money, you don't have to go that far, I suppose. Right. You just day trade and you don't have to go that far. But if you want that big money in the future to see where future plays are coming from, you have to think with this advanced uh, 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 warrior like way of thinking. What's to come? Planning, strategy. Who do I need to contact? What 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 protocol are they utilizing? Um, so it says digital money has the potential to transform the financial sector. Emerging markets and lower income countries stand to gain the most from this dramatic shift. Let me pause there. So not only do they have the most to gain, but remember, I, I've been iterating that that's a lot of money left on the table for us. All of those people out there that, that are underbanked or not not banked at all, they have money and it's just being just left there. Nobody's really accessing that, that as far as banking institutions. Right. So that's money on the table that we can scoop up as block as the blockchain community all right, that we can access that they don't have access to yet. Um, this is another reason why they would want to uh, utilize blockchain so that some of that money is flowing into the banks. This, this is why they this is one of the reasons why logically they would want to tap into blockchain as a medium to tap into that money that has been unrealized for so long. That's just been sitting on the table for so long. So that is a huge benefit to us. We don't want to forget the original base goal, which is to bank the underbanked. Let's get some of that money in here. OK, that raises that price. Then also, let's take that banking money. Let the banks flood it. Let the banks boost the price up. So be it. let them buy as much crypto as they want once regulation is in. And they are, I anticipate. So we're scraping, scooping up that money as well. Then also take into account the high transaction volume and average transaction value of, of legacy systems that will integrate crypt, crypto and uh, integrate blockchain technology like, like how MoneyGram just did, Swift may do because of the ISO uh, uh, mandate that's going to be coming. Uh, IBM, right? All of these banks. So the transaction volume from them and then their their uh, uh, 
their uh, ecosystem partners, which IBM has over, what, what was it, over 100 or 300? They have hundreds of ecosystem partners. So we're scooping up some of, of that money. So the amount of money that crypto is able to, at least the banking coins are able to scoop up in the future is unheard of. If they can even do a small modicum of, of a whole, when it comes to that, it's unthinkable, it's unheard of, and it will never be done again. In my humble opinion, this is this is the big one coming. So only the patient are going to win here. You know, it's a chance. Life is a chance. Every day is a chance you walk out your door. But this is the chance to be so filthy rich. I mean, uh, you'd never have to worry about anything. Generations of your family. We're talking when you say generational wealth, I think actually it's unfathomable to most people. Um, but that is a serious statement. Now, it's, like I said, it's a chance. There's no guarantees in life, but we're not hinging everything on a guarantee. We know the chance that we take. We're hungry for it. We're hunters. We're warriors. We're lions. We're going to hunt. We don't always get the zebra, but should we starve to death, throw our hands our, our hands and paws in the air and say, well, I'm not going to eat today because I can't catch the zebra today. No, we're going to go after this zebra. We don't get this one. We're going to go after another one. If we don't get that one. Go after another. We're going to get a zebra sooner or later. We're going to get a gazelle sooner or later, but we must hunt. Everything is a chance. Ooh, <laughs> we're cooking today. So these developments are very good. And now we're getting more dialogue from the banks themselves, from the heads of banks themselves. Keep that in mind. This is very good progress, which means it's on their minds. They're feeling the pressure and forward developments are occurring. Let's move on here. This document is from the Bank of International Settlements by Burkhard Balls is called Central Bank Digital Currencies. And here's a little blurb I just want to read here. It says, just recently, the Bank for International Settlement published its third survey amongst central banks worldwide. The survey shows a shift from main, mainly analytical work. Let me read that little piece again. The survey shows a shift from mainly analytical work towards technical experimentation. Now, they have to say this because they have been the medium, the intermediary, the arbiter of a lot of this experimentation as they've been bringing a multitude of banks together to experiment with blockchain technology for their CBDCs. Um, I would love to see the if they're releasing documentation on it, which they haven't yet on the results of that experimentation, but that will be huge. Whatever, whatever protocol is on that, whatever protocol name is on that paper is gonna go insane. If, if, they, if they've done well and they have a list of the ones that have done well, which I would anticipate they might not do that. OK, there's a lot of non-disclosure agreements signed and other documents signed that will not allow them to put out that information. But if they do and if they are those protocol that are listed, I was surprised they said Stellar was a finalist. I'm shocked like that. They actually let that out the back, um, but it will show people which blockchains they're leaning towards. And of course, if they're leaning towards that, that could be where big money is going to come from. This is logical. OK, so let's continue on here from mainly analytical work towards technical experimentation. More than 60 percent of central banks are engaged in practical experimental work. Now, I like to say this. Cello has been making a huge push in the banking sector, even bringing in new people. The last few weeks, they've been bringing in an insane team of people to work with cello. OK, um, and they've been having meetings in the banking sector, uh, doing a lot of wonderful things. HBAR, XLM, Algorand, XRP. Uh, I don't think I left anybody out. These are the premier banking coins right now. They are making moves and moving at an, a rapid pace, rapido, rapid pace. And I love every minute of it. It's like it's, it's, it's a beautiful thing to, 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 to witness. Muy linda, mi gente. So, this makes sense when we're thinking 60% are working into exper uh, are working and experimenting with these protocol. You, we have to stay up on the news, continue to do the research to know which ones are being experimented with, which ones might be chosen, who's doing what deals. Uh, as I said before, um, there's a few banks that worked with Ethereum. 
Ethereum transaction fees are are very very high. They and I like I said I don't perceive them keeping Ethereum as their CBDC base rails because it would be akin to just keeping the legacy system. It would be akin to keeping the legacy system with their high transaction fees. And uh, I know some people are going to talk about layer 2 solutions and etc to bring down the uh the uh, uh transaction price transaction costs however as we just read they want to keep things simple you just read that from a document from the international monetary fund imf so you know it's serious so they want things to be simplified not have all of these different layers running so whether ethereum can can come up with something soon to lower those transaction fees soon enough i don't think so but it is a possibility however this is why i believe they will be a lot of the banks will be working with protocol like XLM, XRP, Algorand, HBAR, and Cello, who already uh, have extremely low transaction fees. However, many of these smaller banks, commercial and otherwise, they don't have the knowledge that the Bank of International Settlements has, or the IMF has, or even the European Central Bank has. Okay, they don't have that knowledge just yet, because. Uh, uh, and, but, but and this is why it's important in my humble opinion, that the Bank of International Settlements and the IMF and other large uh, uh, banks, central banks, inform and educate the smaller banks on the research they're doing with these protocol so that they can see that there's other protocol besides Ethereum and Bitcoin that have their, their, uh, their carbon neutral, their low energy, uh, their, their energy efficient, they have extremely low, almost non-existent transaction costs. And I believe once that is known by these other banks, you will see them switch from Ethereum over to uh, a new protocol. However, until that time, Ethereum, once everything is up and fully running, uh, that would mean Ethereum is going to have a heck of an up uptick. A heck of an uptick. The transaction volume will be insane for a moment. If, if they really roll it out on Ethereum, but these, these few banks that have their CBDCs built on Ethereum, that transaction volume and average transaction, average transaction value will make Ethereum, and theoretically, in my humble opinion, that will make Ethereum's price just skyrocket for a moment. Like people will make some very, very healthy gains. So if they do stick with Ethereum, expect Ethereum to take off like you've never seen my humble opinion it's not financial advice i'm not a financial advisor i'm just a humble crypto researcher sharing my research that's all i do not tell people to buy or sell or that doesn't mean anything to me i don't make money off of retail investors buying or selling it means nothing to me i make money when the when the banks step in when the large institutions step in that's why i follow this news i follow them everywhere i hunt them down they're the ones that make the money okay they're bringing the big money but it takes a lot to follow what they're doing and to scrape up information. I get that. I understand that. Okay, so let's move on here. This is a document from the European Central Bank. Now, let me just read a little bit of this. This is uh, a speech by Fabio Panetta, a member of the executive board of the ECB at the ECB Cebra Conference on International Aspects of Digital Currencies and Fintech. This is from October 19th, so it just came out today, and here it begins as such. It is a pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the European Central Bank to the fifth annual meeting of the International Finance and Macroeconomics Program of the Central Bank Research Association. So that's what CBRA is, okay? This year's meeting is taking place virtually, and it brings together participants from nearly 20 time zones which is fitting for a conference that seeks to shed light on how digitalization is changing money and finance globally. Let's skip ahead a little bit. Let's get to the meat of this, right? Well, shall we just permit me one moment, please, if you will. Okay, decisions about the issuance and design of CBDCs require a careful assessment of the trade-offs between risks and opportunities. The international dimension makes the, that makes that assessment more challenging still. So it is already worth thinking about uh, the implications of the cross border use of CBDCs. Now, let me stop right there because see how the European Central Bank is saying this little piece here. Just let me re reiterate this. It says uh, 
Decisions about the issuance and design of CBDCs require a careful assessment of the trade-offs between risk and opportunities. The international dimension makes the assessment more challenging still. This is why they need to attend the meetings. I did not see them in the meetings with the Bank of International Settlements. The IMF was there. Danelle Dixon was also present at a world with at a panel with the World Bank. But I haven't seen the European Central Bank uh, interacting on these panels with these particular powerful entities and because they would know that the Bank of International Settlements is working on that. That's what the MBDCs are about. The MCBDCs, as they stated in their documents, I showed you, are about by having a multitude of blockchains working in and out, inflow, outflow, security. Okay. Uh, what it does is It levels the playing field. I hate to say that. That's the best way I could put it. It levels the playing field and make and it makes it where um, everything can flow from this country to that country to the next country seamlessly with a low transaction cost with with a, with a lot of security. Um, and the head of the Bank of International Sell Settlements, Mr. Augustine, was was constantly reiterating interoperability. See, the European Central Bank is is speaking in this document as though this is not being pushed by both the Bank of International Settlements as well as um, the International Monetary Fund. They're both pushing interoperability and MCBDCs for that reason, for that reason. But they're approaching it two different ways, but it then begs the question, why is the European Central Bank asking these particular uh, questions as though this is not something that is being pushed. The research is being done now. The experimentation is being done now. But what I would think is that you're holding back because of the legacy system and it's making someone somewhere so much money and they have power. And this is why you're bringing up things that are irrelevant and unnecessary because they're problems that are being solved now. They're being worked on now. And entities more, no disrespect, with all due respect, entities more powerful than the European Central Bank, such as the International Monetary Fund and the Bank of International Settlements, I would even go far as far as the Boston Fed, I have to say Boston Fed in particular because they're crypto friendly, a lot of other branches of the Fed and entities in the United States Fed are not crypto friendly. But these particular entities are telling everyone, hey, this is the way that we want to go the pathway we want to take and we're going to solve uh, a lot of these issues with interoperability with a multi-blockchain central bank digital currency system system so let's read on a little bit further it says this is where research can help policy the international dimension of cbdc's is almost unexplored in terms of research almost unexplored does not mean un unexplored as I said before, now maybe what can happen is once the research papers uh, that contain the data on the experimentation that the Bank of International Settlements did with the 16 different cryptos, it was like uh, there was a, quite a few different countries they, they worked with in the African region. And then the separate experiment, Project Dunbar, that they were working on in the, the Asian sector with China and et cetera. Those are two different experiments that went on. Maybe when those papers come out, they can be provided to European Central Bank and other central banks so that they can have the research that they're claiming that it need, that needs to be done. And then we can move from this place where they're saying that it's, you know, the international dimension of CBCs is almost unexplored because now you have fact based data. Uh, it has it has been explored quite deeply now by both Bank of International Settlements and the United States Boston Fed, okay? So this is something where I, I can just see either it's a legacy system uh, pushback mechanism or there, it's just a lack of proper information. I'll put it that way, right? But this is important to remedy so that that European sector is not hindered. Understand that. We don't need hindrances right now. If we want to make this boatload of money, we don't need that. We need everything to be beautiful. Muy linda mi gente. If you want to say muy linda mi gente, then uh, uh, we can't have hindrances like this. El loco. This is crazy. Um, 
So let's continue here. The literature on the international aspects of CBDCs is still in its infancy. I, yes, I could, I could agree with that. It's in its infancy, but it exists. And it's in its infancy, but let's think in relative terms, it is bounteous. It's just that the, what is to come is going to be greater in knowledge and, and, and data collected than what is now, but it's still bounteous. There's lots of information that has been collected. But yes, it's still in its infancy, but let's keep it relative, okay? <laughs> Make it sound like there's nothing going on. After reviewing what we already know about the international dimensions of CBDCs, I will discuss today, today open questions of direct policy relevance. In particular, what is, di what is different about CBDCs compared to alternative monetary financial instruments? And how much international cooperation do we need in view of externalities from CBDC issuance? interactions among CBDCs and the emergence of other innovations such as global stable coins. Um, with interoperability, like I said before, BIS IMF is pushing for full interoperability. I don't know why you would phrase this where there's a limitation. Like, is there a reason you didn't make that clear? What would be the reasoning behind a limitation on the interoperability of a CBDC? Uh, you know, I know there was some concern about spillover and, and things like that, but if we're, we're let's let's be honest, okay? Let's put everything to the side. Let's pull up the sleeves a little bit. Let's be honest. We're moving to a global world system, a one world system. That means that by you could call your CBDC by any name that you want, your stablecoin by any name that you want, and it won't matter because of interoperability. It will be a part of a one system. That's it one system, one world, one global system. That's what we're moving towards. So therefore, as I iterate once, I reiterate, what would be the holdback? There would be no limitation necessary with a system as such, but I believe maybe this is a control issue. You want to have some sort of control, right? You want to have this uniqueness, like we control this, and that is not what the powers of the world want, European Central Bank, and I think you know that, but you, you you're going to push back a little you're going to push back a little bit and you have that right to however i'm telling you and you know this from the documentation from the speeches that have been given they're moving towards a one world system and although a lot of people won't like that it's going to make a lot of us so much money so it won't matter what you call your cryptocurrency it won't matter what it was built on with interoperability the only ones that would suffer truly are the ones that would utilize your system. Let's say you have a high transaction cost. Well, that was a choice for you to have. Your rails have a high transaction cost. However, that doesn't affect everyone else except the ones that are utilizing that particular aspect of the system. What you're worried about is that, I would think, is that if you have these high transaction costs or the system that you chose is not better than someone else's. And I believe in one of these documents, someone iterated that. Someone said that that if someone else's CBDC is better, everyone will start using that. They won't use ours. Then there's instability. Listen, this is why you have to have an even keel system where, where the transaction costs are low across the board and one is not more efficient than the other. But that all comes with time and building. I'm gonna assume you know that, <laughs> but it's what every other big organization and bank is pushing for. A, 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 ba a balanced playing field, okay? So, <laughs> that's all we're gonna cover for today. You know, I don't wanna keep you for too long. I appreciate you watching and I hope this information is, uh, it made an impact on you because knowing these things is going to tell you where everything is going in the future. Um, it's going to tell you, uh, they're gonna give you timelines, these banks. They're gonna give you information and data, PDFs, and it's gonna tell you what protocol they're looking at. Are, are they looking at blockchain, looking past blockchain? Is it gonna be a multi-blockchain uh, system? Or is it gonna be one cryptocurrency running the system? It can dispel myths. And if you know the truth, then you know truly where to go get your money, where to make your money. Bitcoin is going to do well for a long time, but is it, the premier crypto as far as technology? Absolutely not. Are other cryptocurrencies going to take off and make boatloads of money? Absolutely. Are some of the meme, meme coins going to get regulated out of existence and other coins get regulated out of existence? Yes. But can they also, some of these meme coins, make you thousands of dollars? Absolutely. So we're in the money game. We're here to make money. Don't be attached to this crypto or that crypto. Let's acknowledge what they are. Okay, this is a quick money grab. 
And this is a long-term money play. And let's play our chess pieces strategically, meticulously, and with intelligence. And let's get the money as much as we can, wherever we can, legally, and do well for ourselves and our families. But we need the information like this is going to be crucial, crucial in the future. So now we know that they, they are declaring from the IMF, they need regulations, they want regulations. Bank of International S Settlements wants an, a multi-interoperable system. They're pushing for that. Um, also, the Bank of Inter International Settlements is the disseminator of a lot of the information on blockchain research and the exactor or arbiter of much of the research that is going on and making a big push. Um, there's so much to talk about. <laughs> we don't have enough time. So now that you have that information, what are you going to do with it? I know what I'm going to do with it. So until next time, let's get to the money.